Good morning. A, a friendly welcome to all, no matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. Are there any announcements this morning? Okay, after the service, we will have cookies and lemonade back in the cafe. We thought outside might be a little rainy, so we'll just set off back here after church. Thank you. Any other announcements? I just want to tell you, um, my son-in-law, Jordan, he was to the cardiologist this week, and everything's looking really good, so he doesn't have to go back for six months, so three more weeks he can go back to work hopefully and my daughter also went to the doctor the same day and she's doing really well too they're monitoring her twice a week so so far so good so okay let us prepare ourselves for worship Before I start, I wanted to thank Maddie. She made us these beautiful flowers to wear today, and I want to thank her. They're gorgeous. Thank you, Maddie. Jesus said, you must let little children come to me, and you must never prevent their coming. 
the kingdom of God belongs to little children like these. If you'll stand, if you're able, to join me in the call to worship. Come, let us come into the house of the Holy One with song and dance. The Lord of the dance beckons us to join in this time of celebration and joy. We join the psalmist with songs of the glory of the God of hosts. We seek to know God's faithfulness and wisdom. Let us enter God's rhythm of life and follow in the ways of the word. God will bring us home where dancing and joy will never end. And our first hymn is number 33 in the red hymnal, This Is My Father's World. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 33 through 37, and the title of this is, Who is the Greatest? Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Thank you. wonder if uh, anyone has a prayer request that you would like to mention. Zoe? Janet Walpole has uh, melanoma cancer on the top of her head. She has to have removed Tuesday. If we could pray for her and her daughter Sarah is having heart problems right now. She's not sure what's going to happen with that. She has a racing heart. She might have to have a heart monitor. So we need to pray for her also. Thank you.
I would like to inform you all about a prayer that was answered. Uh, my brother, my younger brother, who is 52, he was in the hospital with uh, AFib, and they couldn't get him back in rhythm, and so they had a procedure where they shocked his heart three times, and um, it, it was still not looking well, but um, it, he got back in rhythm, and he is home now, and I know I told Pastor Don uh, about my brother's problems, and uh, he said, I'll pray for him, so I'm sure uh, that was a prayer that was answered, and I wanted to share that with you all. Thank you. I, too, have a Thanksgiving prayer like Earl's. Uh, the farm friend that you all know that we uh, have a strong connection with, um, he is a one of the toughest guys I know and have ever met, and he has never, I think, been admitted to the hospital, and he, he had um, an asthma attack that was um, aggravated. They found out by pneumonia, and when they got him into the hospital, found out that he, I mean, his heart stopped, and so I was thinking about Earl and his brother at the time, and, and uh, they decided it was just stress, so we were grateful, and he is home. Well, let us pray together. It's always so good to be in your presence in this way, God. We are aware, not always, but we are aware that we are ever in your presence. But coming together like this and then pausing for moments of prayer together gives us this deeper sense of being near to you and being able and free to bring to you our requests and our thanksgivings. We want to thank you this morning for this unique set of people that have gathered here today and we represent the entire community of St. John's and we are so glad and so grateful for each one. We thank you for all of the ages that we represent here and all of the personalities and all of the gifts and skills. You design us all and we see your creativity as we look around at each other and we notice what each other brings to this place. And we give you thanks. We know that's true everywhere around the world and we're grateful for the wide variety of people that you have created. And we want to stop to say thank you for each one this morning. And even for the people that we don't like very well or we don't understand at all, we give you thanks because of the opportunity we have to learn a little bit more about that creative gift that you have and that you bring to us. So we're here to not only give thanks, but also to ask forgiveness for the times that we turn up our noses at another person or a group of people. Help us to remember that they are your people too, and that in their own way they express something of your personality, your core being, because we're made in your image, and so we give you thanks for them as well. And we ask you for patience and for abundant love, for forgiveness and a share of the grace that you've given to us as we live in this world you gave us. 
I'd ask that you would heal us as a people where we need it, and we always are in need of healing. We'd ask that you'd heal our nation, heal our world, and help us to know that we have a part to play in that healing. Remind us, touch us, make us ever aware of our part that we play in this great work of bringing healing to our world. And there are certainly people around us that need healing these days, people on our prayer list, people that we have thought about and continue to think about, people that we've never said anything to anybody about, and needs that we have that we've never said anything to anybody about. We're glad that you hear us even when we say our words silently. We believe that you're already at work in their lives and we are thankful for that, but we come and bring their names to you in this public way because you've asked us to pray for one another. So this morning we come with thanksgiving, thanksgiving for Janet Walpole and what she has meant to this church over the years and prayers for her health and for her daughter. We thank you for Karen's, Spears, families, improvement in their health, how grateful we are for those gifts of healing and for Earl's brother and for my friend. So we would bring them and others to you, John Gibbons, Becky Pierce and her family, Susan Brown, Beulah Bowers, Liz McClure, Kathy and Butch Berry, Jean Wolf, and there must be many more. We bring them all to you. Hear us today, we pray, hear those names and others. We often don't know how to pray like we ought, so our prayers are just the cries of our heart, and we trust you with the lives of our loved ones and our friends. So as always this morning, we mean to model our prayers like you taught us. So hear our prayer as, the, as we pray together the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I too want to thank Maddie. Are you up there? <laughs> For the gift today. Uh, thanks, Maddie. <laughs> because this is uh, the day I wanted to talk about children, and so it was so appropriate that she would do that. Um, some time ago now, I, I sat down to think about what are the issues that are on my mind 
uh, that keep on coming back to me in relation to the work here at St. John's. And what are the things or the focus places that I, that I believe that we ought to be putting our attention? And one of those uh, eight or 10 things that I, I brought to my attention so that I wouldn't forget them was the business of children and our taking care of the needs of kids both the ones in our congregation, and then you might not be aware, but it's true that there are a set of children that are not attending the congregation right now. Maybe they did some before the pandemic, uh, but they don't attend right now, but they're still thinking about it and they're still considering it, and so they're standing on the fringe. And then there are those that are just a little bit beyond that, that fringe that I see over in the Gathering Place uh, playground uh, often as I come and, and sit in the office and study for Sunday morning sermon. And then there are kids beyond that range. And there are just, there are just kids all around us. And so I was thinking about all of them when I put that on my list. I arrived here three years ago, as you already know. I preached in July sometime or other, and, um, and then I think uh, maybe once or so in August. So I've been here three years. And uh, I remember so vividly coming uh, that day to the council meeting, and I guess it was council meeting or whoever it was at the time that was supposed to consider the pastor. Was it council? I believe it was council. And um, had all kinds of trouble finding them because they hide themselves in the basement at the time, and uh, um, they didn't want anybody to know and led me on a goose chase in many different directions until I finally found them down there. And so I asked them a question. I, if I remember correctly, I wanted them, I asked them, what should I know about St. John's? Well, they had several things to say about people in general, and then, and then they pointed out all of your faults in particular, so I'd know. And, 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 and that was really helpful because it's proven to be just very true and um, accurate. Um, so you know that's a lie, don't you? Um, they didn't at all. But the, what the, one of the things that they did say was, we don't have any children. That was, that was the thing that they said about us all. We don't have any children. And I think it was at that meeting, and nobody is here to uh, tell me it wasn't true exactly, but I think it was at that meeting that I first heard that either, it was either Becky Pierce or Tracy Krupp that was the youngest person in the congregation. Do you remember that? I think you might remember that. And, um, and whichever one it was, I can't, I'm not sure, was just shocked to think about that, 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 was, that they were the youngest in the whole congregation probably at the time. And I'm thinking about that business of not having children around and what was the truth for us at that time. It's hard to not have kids around, I think, um, in, in, so, in some ways. And I think one's, uh, when you're, you don't have any children around and you're a church congregation, a church family, you feel somehow like you're not complete. I mean, every, things are just not quite the way they ought to be. There ought to be little noises around the congregation. There ought to be toys scattered here or there. There just ought to be signs of young life around us. And so you begin to feel a little bit incomplete. And then it's easy to feel like there's something wrong with us, like we're deficient somewhere, somehow, or maybe we're defective because we don't have any kids around. That's not a good thing to feel at all. And so, um, so I understand kind of the dilemma and the way churches feel about that sort of thing. Churches are like families, you know, and when you have a large family, uh, you expect that there's a certain percentage of the family that's going to be uh, young and under the age of uh, maybe 10 or under the age of five. Um, my, my family now is much more filled with that age of kids than I ever expected it to be, but they are there. And you expect in a family like that 
to have kids around and somebody needs to feed the kids. And we're always talking about how do we take care of the kids? And at, on that end of the spectrum, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you need to have grandpas and grandmas around that you need to help up the stairs. And so there's always that concern about the extremities, you know, the people that have the special needs. And that helps us to make us feel complete, doesn't it? I mean, it really adds something to the whole view of the family. And it's the kind of place where all of these ages are and all of these different thing, people are with different needs that helps us to learn more and better. We learn when we're in an environment where there's diversity. So we started our journey together, you and I, with only the oldest part of the range covered. And I think you felt kind of bad about yourselves sometimes. I tried to encourage you because really, the truth is, there was nothing wrong with you. You just had part of the job done. And you did the part, you did the part on the upper end really well. And there are some fine specimens of older people in this congregation. And so you decided what would be better than get another specimen of an old man and get him to be the preacher and how it would look so nice. So, so you can either see yourself as being wrong or deficient or something, or you just see as yourself as the journey is only part done and there is more work to do. And I think that's the way it is. Uh, we should be proud of ourselves. And then comes Jacob and Maddie. I say this often because they have so changed our congregation. I just remember those first times they were here. And then their moms and dads came, of course, you know, and then some grandmas and grandpas came, and then a couple of aunts and uncles, I think they were. And they've been such a blessing to us that they have come here in the last few, uh, few months. And, and I'm glad that Maddie and Chris and Ashley are here today working the sound the system and, uh, and next Sunday, we're going to ex uh, explore this a little more uh, carefully. And I think that uh, next Sunday, you'll be able to see at least the moms and dads of these little ones. So anyway, they've been such a blessing. And, and I, I don't think I'm greedy to say I really would kind of like to have a few more around here. I think it'd be a good thing for us. Now. Now I want to drop back to the scripture that Karen read for us so well this morning. With the 12 disciples in that first century, it wasn't exactly like ours, but it had some connection to teach us, I think. And it wasn't the case that they couldn't get any kids in their group of 12. I don't think they ever tried. And besides that, I don't think they actually wanted them. They were a bother. Can you see a little three-year-old in the middle of those 12 men. They just weren't for it, I think, basically. Actually, they were guilty of pushing them away. Yeah, no, that doesn't seem right. They were actually guilty of pushing them away when the kids and the parents wanted to come and see Jesus, and the parents wanted to come and bring their kids to see Jesus, and the disciples said, don't bother him. Come back tomorrow. Make an appointment. Dial, punch this number, and you can get an appointment to see him sometime or something. Can you imagine that from those disciples? Twelve grown men. And not only were they rude to the kids, there was something else going on at about the same time, or at least the gospel writers put these two things together and it fits and it probably happened about the same time. The whole group was wandering from place to place like they did. That's how they got around, is walk from place to place. And they were walking around the Sea of Galilee, if you have your geography kind of in, in mind, and Jesus was teaching them as they were walking along in the dusty roads of Galilee. And they came to a town called Capernaum which Jesus had adopted as his own hometown because they kicked him out of Nazareth. And so Capernaum was kind of his hometown. And on the route, Jesus picked up, like a mom or a dad does, 
how did they do that? How did you do it? Do you remember? He picked up that they were in the middle of a big discussion that had gotten quite heated on the route. And they were on their way to some place. And so when they got to Capernaum, Jesus turns around and asks them what they're talking about. Marianne and I just spent a week in California with Marianne's daughter and husband and three kids, including an 11 and a 10 year old boy, two boys, and then a two year old girl who came later. We know about this stuff. They were arguing. Mom and dad picked it up and said, what's going on? Well, Jesus turns around to his 12 and he said, what were you talking about? As far as I know, as far as the scripture tells us anything, not one of the 12 would admit what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. There is no record that anybody fessed up and said, here's what we were talking about. But Jesus knew because it's the argument that always happens between the two boys and our grandkids and in your families, I assume, in some fashion or other. Jesus pushed them a little. What were you talking about? Jesus knew the topic. And the boys and kids often talk about this topic, even though they don't say the words exactly. The topic was, who's the greatest? Don't they, isn't that what's going on? That was the whole week in California. They were always fussing about who's the greatest in some way or another. And it happened when we were out of the house, it happened in the house, it happened when we were swimming in the pool. It's always about who's the greatest, who's the biggest, who's the strongest, who's most important, who gets the attention. That's the debate the whole time. And it doesn't, isn't limited to kids. Muhammad Ali, you ever heard of him? He's not around these days. He spent a lifetime fussing about who was the greatest. That's what he was called, the greatest. He called himself that, not that anybody else did, he did. And he never quit saying he was the greatest to convince himself that he was. And he was beating up people all the time just to make sure that he was the greatest. He was just one of grown men acting like children. He did a most amazing thing. It is exactly probably what Jenny would have done as an in inner teaching years, what Ashley probably still does. He looked for an illustration without directly confronting them for their childish silliness. He didn't say anything at first. He just reached over and gathered a little one, probably from the child's mama's arms, and held her in his arms. And then he spoke to the 12. And he said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and servant of all. My guess is that gave him something to think about all day and maybe for a long, long time. You want to be first? You've got to make your way to the bottom and be servant of all. And then about children, he said, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Ooh, that's a big deal. And suddenly, this whole conversation, this whole attitude toward children takes a big, big turn. 
with some huge, huge consequences when Jesus said, if you want to welcome that child, you welcome me. And if you welcome me, you welcome the one who sent me. And the author of the book of Luke in this very same event has a little bit of a twist on the event. And he has Jesus saying something even more poignant and, and right to the point. And J.B. Phillips in his translation has Jesus saying this in Luke instead of in Mark. You must let, this is Jesus speaking, you must let little children come to me. And you must never prevent their coming. Other places it says don't hinder them. You must never prevent their coming. The kingdom of God belongs to little children like this. And I tell you, the man who will not accept the kingdom of God like a little child will never get into it at all. You talk about letting a conversation that seems trivial drop about a story and a half. That's what Jesus did. This is a big deal. Pay attention, Jesus said. What was Jesus saying to those 12 grown men? That we shouldn't spend our time arguing? Well, yeah, doesn't help anyway. But I think a bigger message was that we're never totally complete in ourselves and alone. We need others to experience the full range of God's greatness and glory. And in particular, we adults aren't enough. We need what the kids bring to us. Isn't that a different focus than we usually have? Aren't we usually saying they need what we bring? Jesus turned that around and Jesus said, we need what they bring. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Pay attention, listen up, learn. You have to have the children around, sit down at their feet and learn what the truth is about the kingdom, the things that you have forgotten and the things that have, you've gotten all mixed up about. And you need all sorts of people, not just the children, but all sorts of them as well. People of different ages, people of different sorts that round out the fullness of God for us and help us to understand the wholeness, things that we would not know otherwise. The reign, reign of God, the kingdom is not about 12 sweaty men. Oh, it's about that, but it's so much more. You men, you adults need to listen to the children you should never catch yourself pushing them away or hindering them because the kingdom belongs to them. How that changes everything in our ministry and our life together as a beloved community. I don't know that I know all of what that means that the kingdom belongs to the children, but I know that it's important. And our question is, what do those little ones know that we need to know about God and about God's reign. It's not just what we have to teach them. That is important. What do they have to teach us? They know some things because it isn't long in our lives after we're born that we get distorted, that the whole idea of love gets distorted that the whole idea of safety and care gets to, you know that's true, isn't it? And so the closer we can get to understanding what the child knows when they come into the world, the more we know about the great care, the great love, the great wisdom of our divine Father. So, that's why we're sprucing up the nursery. <laughs> yep, that's 
That's why we're doing that. And it's not just for Maddie and Jacob, although it's for them, but it's for all the rest that may want to come. Now we're ready for them. That's why we put so much in, uh, emphasis and so much energy into the playground back there. You thought it was just for the kids to have fun. It's so that we both can learn from each other about the meaning of God. And we do it at the oddest, strangest times. The times when we least expect it. Bam. And we're increasing the odds of those moments when we have a playground out there. And people come there, you know, that don't belong to our church and never will. So, just increases our odds of understanding God better. What an investment. What a good deal. We're the ones that benefit. Wow. That's why we made the gathering place. It's a connecting place of people that are not like us. People that don't belong here. <laughs> because we might get to see God in a way that we never could otherwise. There are places, those are places where we old people get a chance to look into the face of a young one and learn something. We who have become accustomed to only our ways and our habits and our preferences encounter children from whom we need to hear and from whom we need to learn. There's big work that we do here at the corner of Canal and Walnut. We put this place a long, long time ago on an intersection and now we're building on it. We're depending on the crossroads, on the intersections where our lives are changed and when we grow, where we grow because we have seen the kingdom in the words of scripture, in the hearts and faces of each other, in the eyes of children and of the stranger and of the broken. And today Jesus says to us, like he said to his disciples, don't waste your time worrying about who's the greatest. Invest your time in making sure that the little ones are truly welcome among you. Put your time there. Forget the argument. Open your doors. Open your hearts. Open your ears. Treat them as if they had the keys to the kingdom because they do. May God give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Amen. When David danced, rejoicing before the Ark of the Covenant, his joy was not complete until he had made an offering of thanks and distributed gifts of food and drink to all who were in need. Perhaps the most joyful and challenging of all the commandments is to generosity and mutual care, to love one another as God loves us. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude, heartfelt commitment, and praise.
you'll please join me in the dedication prayer. Beloved Jesus, you surprise us by naming us your friends. Your dance of faithfulness and life opened before us a way of unexpected justice, mutuality, and joy. Take these gifts and bless them and let them serve your people at home and throughout the world. All of us, your cherished friends. Our next hymn is hymn number 323 in the black hymnal, Little Children Welcome. I just... Well, go in peace and know that as little children ourselves, we are welcome and Jesus loves us. <laughs> 